by the way, uh, your good friend Bob Schwartz, or mm-hmm. the Bob Father, as he's known in the Buddy Games, uh, told me to start the interview by asking you this, and your sister confirmed okay. you had this uh, ability, uh, that you can fart on command. <laughs> it's kind of, we just did have it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a skill. Everybody's got a skill, <laughs> and you've had that yeah, your whole life. My whole life, yeah. Um, and your sister did also. You, did, that, did you pick that up? Oh, yeah. oh, oh perfect, there's... perfect, great. Way to start this interview. That's <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Uh, your sister also told me to bring up that uh, one time she pissed you off, and you pooped on her head. Yeah, I did. We're starting with a fart joke and then a fat and then a poop joke right off the bat. What, what happened right there? The <laughs> well, first of all, I was probably four or five years old. Okay. And I still, but I still remember it. I, I, she did something. I don't remember what she did, but I remember pooping on her head, like right on top of her head. And, <laughs> and then I tried to convince her not to tell mom. Like mom's not going to know. <laughs> I like, I like threatened her, you better not tell mom. And I was like, what am I supposed to do? And she's two at the time. <laughs> so yeah, another true story. And w- what happened from there? I oh my God, I think I, I, I think I blacked out after that because my mom was so mad. Your sister's one of the most important people uh, in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I want to get into kind of a little bit of your guys' uh, history, but... You know, I know you have been very protective mm-hmm. over her over the years. Um, she ends up marrying your best friend. Yes. Or at least the person who was your best friend. I don't yes. know. Um, <laughs> but how did you first find out they were dating? Uh, first of all, I have three sisters, and I love them all yeah. dearly. We'll, we'll preface it with that. Uh, and two, two half-sisters. Two half-sisters, and Ashley, is, was, we have the same father and mother. M- Mom had the youngest when she was 45. Yes. Uh, but it was really kind of you and your uh, yeah, Ashley. Yeah, it, I mean, it was. I mean, that's the thing about, about siblings is that, you know, they're with you from the very beginning. You know, your kids come later, your spouse comes later, but your brothers and sisters, they're there the whole run. And she and I have been through a lot together, and she's a, she's an awesome woman. She really is. She's just such a she's a ride or die for sure. Uh, Ashley's amazing. Mackenzie's awesome. Cassidy, our little flower child, is equally as awesome. But yes, I did meet Cameron as a freshman in college. He went to West Hope High, which is about an hour from where we're from in Minot, and uh, he was a good buddy of mine. We, we I mean, he, his last name is Deshaw. Mine was Demel, so our lockers were right next to each other, and in, in, we played football at Minot State together. And then we were also both biology majors, so we had every class together, and we were roommates. So he, uh, it wasn't until, uh, but my sister was always kind of, you know, she was still in high school when we were freshmen and sophomores, so she would kind of show up at these college parties, and I'd get so pissed. I was like, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be at this party. You're, you're in high school. Get out of here. And you, did, Ashley told me, like, you would literally throw her out of the Oh, party. I would. I would. I was so, I was, because all my friends wanted to f*** her. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, get out of here. And you, stop looking at my sister. You know, it was like that. I was, like, very protective of her. Um, so when she started dating Cameron, pff, 10, 10 years after, after college, probably, she, she had moved to California, and while she was in California, she started seeing Cameron. I don't know when she came back to home to visit or something. He'd been in Florida. He was a professional water skier also. And she moved to California in the first place because of you. I, is that why she moved there? That's what she remember. said. Yeah, she probably did because I probably she was probably very curious about it. And I was having fun out there. Uh, she probably wanted to get out and go see the world. And yeah, so she, I didn't realize that's why she left. But yeah. Uh, so I find out that she's, she's dating Cameron. I was like, that son of a... Wait a second. I love Cameron. I couldn't ask for a better dude than that for my sister. He's truly like one of the best guys I know. And she'd been dating meatheads up to that point, so I was, I was okay with it, actually. It took, it, I, I don't ever remember being upset about it. At, at first, I was like, wait, now is he my best, one of my best friends because he was trying to get at my sister this whole time? Or is he really my friend? You know, I was really thinking... 
And what, what, what went on when I wasn't around? Were they actually seeing each other? But I got over that quickly. So you're the older brother. Uh, you know, you would be there at bas- her basketball practices. You'd help her practice. If she was scared growing up, she'd uh, come to, you know, your room uh, at, at, at night. Um, in what ways did you help raise her? Well, I think we raised each other in a lot of ways. Uh, Mom and dad got divorced when I was a fourth grader. Uh, they both struggled for quite a while, but then, you know, are uh, doing great now. But yeah, it was a rough several years after the, after the divorce. And, uh, and your mom wasn't around much because she had three well, jobs. Well, she had three jobs, yeah. yeah. And, she was, and she was stressed out. We were broke. Dad was getting on his feet. Um, and you know, we just had each other, you know, we really did. We, we, and we were home alone a lot. And I think that, uh, you know, that is pr- part of the reason why we're so close is that, you know, we really have gone through it all. So, and I think, it all means what? It just like, I mean, she's been there. She's seen me with all my heartbreak. She's seen me with, you know, all the uh, disappointments and, you know, had a couple things in sports that happened that were really, really heartbreaking. Um, girls um, just struggling in, you know, California. Uh, br- br- brings a tear to your eye almost thinking about it. Are you trying to make me cry right no, now? No, but it, it, like I can tell. Like, no, no, it, no. It, I, I'm, I'm, it, I'm like, moves you. It, it does move me because we're, we were very, you know, she's, she's truly... Uh, She's truly been there for me through thick and thin. And no matter what, no matter how many times I'd screw up, she was always there. So, yeah, she's, um, she's fantastic. Ashley's in, you, you probably got a sense of that when you talk to her. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have, you realize as you get older, there's so few people mm-hmm. in your life, if yeah. any, that. Yeah. Yes, that is the truth. It is, you know, whether it's your, like I said, your sister, your brothers. Um. Your friends. I have a lot of friends who are very, you know, who have also been cl- very close to me f- since kindergarten, you know, and we've maintained these relationships. And I always say it's ha- really hard to make old friends. And so the older I get, the more I really uh, value these relationships, whether it's my sisters or, uh, you know, my, my, my close group of friends. It's, uh, I've been very fortunate to have people in my life for a very long time. The divorce you mentioned, um, you said it was a bad divorce. In what ways? Well, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty contentious. You know, they, uh, I, we don't, I'm not even sure the reason why, but it was not, it was, they, they still don't, <laughs> they still don't talk. They can't, they can't be in a room together well, to this day, right? They can be. They, they've gotten to the point where they can be, but they're just not friendly, and it's just sort of like one's in the other side of the room. And, I'm like, and we're always like, come on, you guys already. You know? right. But, hey, um, you know, that's probably because they had so much love for each other that, that the pain was that much worse once they you know, finally broke it off. But, um, yeah, it was... It was rough, and it was rough on both of them, too, because we got in a car accident. I think we kind of started setting the whole thing off. We got in a really bad car accident when I was a fourth grader. And uh, What happened? We were just driving down this road on the way from uh, just out. In the, we lived out of town, out of, out of mine, at about five miles, and we had to drive. We were driving into school, and it was the middle of a terrible blizzard. And we were in this old van, and the van started, we are coming over this hill and started coming down. We started sliding right into the other lane, and bam, we hit this other car. Mm-hmm. Uh, I flew from, I was in a, a couch in the back of the van. This is before they had, like, seat belt regulations and all that. And I, had, and I flew from the back of the van all the way up and hit my lip, and I had this giant fat lip. But my sister and my mom were really, really, my sister was in the driver's seat as a second grader. Again, not a lot of you know regulations for for kids back then. Uh, Wait, comp- was, she, was she actually the one driving? No, no, okay, no, or, no, no, no. Okay, got it. My mom was driving. Okay. My sister was in the front seat. Yeah, she probably okay. probably should have been in the back uh-huh. somewhere. Um, mom, I couldn't wake her up. It was uh, really, really just a whiteout blizzard, freezing cold. I remember people 
coming, running down through the blizzard from these houses that had seen it. And, uh, and she was, and I was hard on Ashley too. I have a lot of regret about that. Why? You know, older brother stuff. You know, I just always, you know, teasing her and, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, but uh, I mean, that's, you're probably yeah, it's, unnecessarily yeah, we're, we're, hard on Yeah, your, yeah, it, 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 it's not, it, it, again, you, it was a long time, but. Uh, and but you don't in have this, the relationship you have today if right. you actually did that an, to the point of something. And an older brother is, is usually hard on his younger brothers and sisters anyway. Yeah. But, you know, in this case, she had a compound fractured leg and she had her snow pants on and I couldn't see that the bone was actually sticking out of her leg. And she mm. was like, she couldn't, she's like, I can't stand on my leg. It's like, quit your complaining. Mom, I can't wake mom up, quit your, and, and I find out later that she like literally, her bone was sticking out of her leg. Uh, my mom uh, got a, she hurt her neck pretty bad and took, you know, took, they were both in the hospital for a long time. So that was kind of the beginning of the rough patch that we all went through. <clears throat> and, you know, everybody's good now, thankfully. Yeah. Everybody's still with us, thankfully. And so after they got divorced, you mentioned the, the, the struggles. Uh, you know, I think your dad slept in his car for a, a while, <laughs> had an apartment above a liquor store. Yeah. At, at another point, you guys were bouncing around mm -hmm. at, at house to house on the other side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, how visible was that struggle to you as a kid back then? You know what? He never let us on, or he never, he never made it feel like he was in a bad place, but it, it, at a certain point I was like, well, dad's clothes in the back of his car and I hang on a rack. And then it just kind of dawned on me that, oh my God, he's living in this thing. But my dad is tough, man. He's really tough and he was, and he, he always, was there for us when he could be. He was a, you know, he, yeah, he lived above the, the grog shop, the liquor store, but we didn't care. We were just as happy, you know, just to go over there and rent a VCR and watch movies from Blockbuster or wherever it was. Your friend Greg, when I was talking to him the other day on the phone, got choked up uh, recalling the moments when your dad would leave and how emotionally impactful he remembered that uh, being for you guys it was probably really hard for my dad because he didn't they, you know mom, it was he didn't get to see us as much as he wanted to you know and it was yeah it was difficult for him but we didn't know any differently yeah we really didn't we didn't know we thought it was just and i never felt like it was uh it wasn't as, it was probably sadder for him watching it than it was for us because it's not like we felt like dad wasn't there if we needed him. Right. What does it make you think about when they take you back to those moments? I think, I think what I, th you know, again, when you're, when you're in it, you don't understand the struggle until you're, you know, much older. But I think for me, it was, it was more about... Yeah, I don't, I don't, it, 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 I was a kid just, just, it, when you don't have things, you don't know what you're missing, you know, and for us, it was just whatever, so. Your mom's tennis shoes, hmm. uh, you, there was a period of time where you wore them, right? Oh, yeah. Well, my mom was a gym teacher, so she had, she had all these matching uh, sweatsuits, and she would always have a matching pair of tennis shoes to go with them. She had like 50 pairs of tennis shoes. Um, and when I, my feet got big enough, I could wear them. And they were most, a lot of them were men's tennis shoes. And so I, I had like a free, you know, and it would piss her off because, it, you know, she didn't want me like messing up all of her sneaks. But I would, I would, I would definitely go in there and, and wear her tennis shoes around. How big of a deal uh, was it? Ashley told you that? That's funny. She yeah. remembered that. How big of a deal was it the one time uh, she got you a pair of hockey pants? Who, mom? Uh -huh. Got me hockey pants? Yeah. Like, as I. Yeah, the Cooper Alls. You know, just really nice, kind of oh, unexpected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
I don't know what Ashley's recollection of that story is, but back then it was like we played hockey and Cooperalls were the were the thing for anybody that was you know playing hockey. It wasn't the breezers; it was like the the full pants. They're hideous looking now. I've I've, I've gone back and looked at them recently, but uh, yeah, that was the thing. And I remember I got Cooperalls, and I was like, whoa. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Did she say that I got ex like? Excited about it? Why don't... Uh, that it was just a big deal. It was a big deal. Those Cooper Alls were a big deal. You know, and this is one thing that, you know, is, and I, and I, you know, I'm thinking about all this stuff now and I get a little bit, you know, stirred up by it, but. And, and that was my question. Like, it seems like while it must have obviously been tough times, I mean, that's the period that made mm -hmm. you into the yeah. man you are now. What, but what is it, thinking back on that, that affects you? Well, I think it's 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 not so much. I don't think back on it like with with with, with you know bad memories yep. because I remember our, our my childhood was really full. We played, we played, we just like we had we had a lot of free freedom too because it was you know like like she said, mom was working a lot, so it was like I don't look back at my childhood and, and think that oh we were poor us we didn't have this because we we had enough to we were fine. But for me, yes, you're probably right. That is like I really appreciate things that I have now because of that. Um, and I think that you know, for my son, doesn't have to struggle like that. But how do you instill those same things in, in your own kids once you've you know been able to be successful? You know, can I instill? Can you instill those same sort of uh, work ethics or? or I'm not even sure how to say it, but you know, how do you, you, you can't manufacture struggle, you know? You have to somehow find a, a way around it and still instill these same sort of uh, values or work ethics without having to go through that struggle. And it's, it's, that's one of the hardest things is, it, is a parent is still teaching him, because we just had to do it. We just had to go do it. How do you figure that out? How do I figure what out? That. I, I don't I mean, know. The, like the balance between you want to rightfully yeah. provide all the opportunities that your success has yeah. afforded you, mm -hmm. but doing that without dampening motivation. Exactly. Yeah. That's that, that therein lies the struggle because, yeah. you know, you have to be really, and you know, Audra, my wife is incredible about, you know, making sure that he is, she's much, she's more disciplinary than I am. Uh, and only out of love for him. She's really, really good about making sure that he gets up, takes his plate to the dinner. We sit at the dinner table. We do this. You know, it's, it's he and I. When I was, you know, it was, when I, it was just him and I alone. I, we'd eat at the couch. We, you know, it was, it was like a couple of bachelors. So she brings structure. She brings that. You know, um, she doesn't act as if we have a lot of stuff. She still treats. You know, she parents. Even though she's his stepmother, she still parents like. Uh, as if we didn't, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you have a lot or a little, you still have to have certain um, values and, 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 and manners and, and things like that. I, I understand your upbringing uh, made you more emotional as well in two different ways. One, uh, sometimes it'd be the waterworks. Uh, other times it would be just bad temper. Yeah. Ashley tell you that? Uh, no, that was just from reading stories. Oh yeah. 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 That's the truth. I was, uh, and it, it, it is. And so I see my son now and he's got that, he's, as, he's emotional like I was. Um, where, and where do you think that came from? I don't know. You? I don't know. Maybe it was, you know, repressed stuff for, as a kid that I wasn't, didn't know how to deal with. And I would, it manifest in, in, uh, you know, uh, lashing out, having a temper, being frustrated, not having not being able to understand or control what I was feeling. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, but I see it now in my son, especially when he's playing sports. He's, he's recently got into soccer. And we played right down here on the beach with all the kids from around the lake, came over to play, and, and he lost in this championship game, and he was devastated by it. Part of me was like, this is so good for him. You know, part of me wanted to go over and say, hey, 
I get it, you know, this is, this is, this is part of it. Part of me wanted to say, like my dad said to say, nobody likes to cry baby. <laughs> My dad said that to me because I because I was really really emotional from about fifth grade to about seventh grade, fourth grade to seventh grade, and he uh, he finally had to because every time I'd lose a game in soccer I would, or hockey I would just like I couldn't handle it. I was just so competitive and so emotional about it, and he was right. You know, it might, might not have been the best approach or tactic, but it worked. I was like, you know what? He's right. I can't just you know bust out crying every time we lose. You gotta, you gotta be tough, but you know, at the same time, I like the fact that he's got those, he's got, he cares that much and he's, he's emotional and he, he'll learn how to handle it um, as he gets older. After you started having a lot of success, as I understand it for a long time, you kind of felt like a fraud or huh. uh, that you weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. um, explain that. Well, you know, I think part of it is because I came where I, what I, where I came from. People from North Dakota don't typically go off to Hollywood and become an actor. It was like a very, and, and, and I'm, like I said, I was very close to my friends and family back here. So I just remember being like up there in front of the camera on TV going, oh my God, they all know, they, they all know I'm not supposed to be, this is, I'm such, a, I'm just an absolute fraud. This is not who I am. I mean, I felt like I could be, I felt like I wanted to be, I felt like I had the ability to do it, but I didn't grow up with that at all. So suddenly going from a uh, small town kid from North Dakota, um, grew up probably on the wrong side of the tracks too. Uh, and what does that mean? Just, you know, like I said, we struggled a lot as, as kids. We, were, we, we weren't like in the nice part of town. Um, everybody's done better over the years, but you know, everybody struggles and I think it's a good thing. And I'm glad that I came from there, I really am. But, um, you know, I just, all I could think about was, I didn't, I, I didn't belong here. I, I, it, and, it would, and it took me up until, I don't know, three or four years ago before I finally felt like, okay, you do belong here. It was buddy games. Wasn't it like yeah, Buddy I, Games was a big was a big part of it. Something about directing that. Yeah, because I finally, you know, I I didn't get a lot of respect, and I still maybe don't get a lot a lot of respect uh, as an actor. Sometimes I, I I do, but you know, it's it's okay. I'm not, but and I know and I know why. Uh, I think that as you get older, you start to you just get more and more seasoned. You get more experience, and it just becomes more natural and you know, rightfully so I was real green when I first started I've watched some of those old clips and I was bad but uh, I knew but there I had moments where I, I knew that okay if I can just continue to stay in the pocket and I can continue to keep learning and not be in my head and just and commit to that thing that's in there that you know brought you here just stick with that mm -hmm. and um, I think that that is you know, it took me a long time to really trust that I did belong, that I was good enough, and that I had the ability, and I, and I could express myself creatively. And I really trusted myself as a director to be like, you know what? I've been doing this long enough. I know enough to know that I don't have to know everything. And if I surround myself with good people, I can do this, you know? And directing a movie is hard. It is really hard. It is it is all consuming. You know, I wrote the first one all the way through. Uh, you know, delivering it. You know, in in the publicities and all in, yeah. in all the publicity campaigns and everything else we had to do. So, you know, the writing, the directing, being in it, the editing, the running a crew, understanding uh, how to get people behind what you see, a you know, vision that you have for this thing and, and, and not micromanaging, but letting those people who have all this talent do their thing and let them be creative. Everybody seemed to sort of come together and it was awesome. And that's when I really sort of felt like, you know what, you do belong here. I, and I'm gonna ask you more about Buddy Games uh, momentarily, but I brought up that personality trait in you uh, to your sister. Um, what do you think she said as to her view as to why? Oh, sports probably. Uh, she said because of how hard uh, your guy's mom was. Oh, both of you, and and that she's like, 
Josh could have literally the best game ever, and uh, our mom would point out. Oh, the, what I didn't do right? Yeah. Yeah, probably, but you know what? She, she probably saw that more than I did. I never took that as mom was hard on me. I, I mean, she, mom was tough, but, you know, I knew that she loved us and she did the best she could. But, yeah, she was, she was tough. I mean, she's probably doing it because she loved you. Yeah, and you know what? I should probably be a little bit more like that with my kid. Because you think so? that's part, yeah, I think there's something to it, you know? They say, <laughs> you just got to be, you know, as a father, you got to be very careful about how much you call your kids. And I, and I, and I try, and I'm, fairly tough on I'm not like my mom was on me but you know you got to be careful because if you don't they turn out to be a little snowflake <laughs> you know and you don't want a snowflake you want a kid who can go out into the real world and and, and hold his own and you're very tough on yourself on sets too. yeah in the same way you used to be in sports mm -hmm. back in the day um, explain those situations and like what you'll do to yourself on set? Well, you know, when I first got, when I first got uh, into the business, I was very hard, and I, and I have been. I still do get really hard on myself sometimes, but I've learned to, like I said, trust myself a little bit more so I'm not as bad. I know that I, you know, you don't need to get, but I, part of it was, was strategic too because I would, if I had to get into a, a certain headspace, I, the only way I know how to do it was actually get myself there by beating the Myself. Okay, and give, not give, by beating myself, but really, like, give some color to what that. that I don't know. Means. I would, uh, you know, I would go to pretty, I would go to pretty extreme places in my head, uh, and if I wasn't perfect, and I had a very, a very much a perfectionist, and, and expected a lot on myself. And maybe you're right. Maybe that is my mom in my head. But so those extreme places, what are you thinking about? It just depends on the scene. Um, sometimes it was out of embarrassment for not doing as good of a job as I thought I could do. Mm -hmm. Or if it was like an intentional thing to get myself into a dark headspace for whatever the situation was. Um, but I have, but I, 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 it was, it was a really, um, but and take that and give, as much or as little as you want, no. but in the, when you, it's intentional to get yourself into that space, what what do you think about? Well, I think about what it what it would really be. First of all, like it's, let's say uh, a, a father just lost his daughter, and 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 he has to find the guy that did it. I would actually lit literally sit in a room for like all morning before we'd go to work, and and I would sit there and I would imagine like to, to the detail of what that would what what he did and what and what it felt like and what this guy would feel like and what I wanted to do to that guy because of it and I would get in these crazy like dark sort of spots that when I got on set people would be like whoa what the fuck is wrong with this dude you know yeah. and it was and it was I don't know if, I don't think it's maybe it's part method but it was it was the only way that I knew how to go there you know um, I didn't want to pretend it I wanted to actually go there and that can be really, uh, that can be really exhausting and fatiguing, and uh, not the probably the healthiest way to <laughs> get to that headspace, because you don't just leave it there as soon as you walk off set. You walk off set, and it's still and it's still there. You still you're still in that mindset, and you know it would take me a while to come out of whatever whatever place I worked myself into. Uh, what's a while? Day, two days, a week. Really? Depending on, depending on how long you had to sit in that. And, and how do you get out of it? Well, a good example is I did uh, Vegas. I was on Vegas and I went to, I was on the TV show Las Vegas and in the second season my character had gone, he got deployed to Iraq and he, and he came back and he was, and he'd seen some and he was, in a real dark place. And the season, we had the same crew as we had the season before and I came back and we had a couple new new guys on the crew. And I was, I was like sitting alone, just, you know, doing, you know, trying to get to this space. And I remember, and, I'm, and I became good friends with these guys, but they were like, dude, that's first couple of days on set with you. I was like, oh my God, I gotta do a whole season with this guy. 
because I would be, you know, I had to, it's the only way I knew how to do it was to get into this place and stay there. Didn't talk to anybody. I was just sort of in it. And people didn't want to be around me and people would, would, would sort of avoid me because they could just, they could feel my, that, that whatever that was that I was doing. And it, it put, it scared people a little bit, including me. Really? Yeah. How do you get yourself out of it when you're in it? Uh, just try to get back to normal life. You know, it's a it's a it's a relief though when that when you're through that bit and then when you get like to go do something different within you know within whatever character you're playing and, mm -hmm. and it, it's just like oof I did it and if you really went there and you're happy proud of the work that you did, mm -hmm. it's it's like I I, I literally. Like at the end of every movie, especially if there's something that does require the, these these difficult scenes, by the end of the movie, we'll have like a, a rap party, and I just dance. <laughs> I literally, I never dance, except for maybe at weddings. In which case, you end up in the hospital. Yes, and so <laughs> that's good. You dipped into your research, uh, and I would just—it's like this release of like, oh God, it's over. You know, I can just let all that all that go, and that was um, that was part of the reason I did it. I mean, I'm not gonna say I went dancing, but it was it was just like I would find something contrary to what I was feeling like to sort of snap me out of it. But it's not something that when you're in it and you know you have to be in it for some sort of prolonged period for this character that you have to like drink or something like that to allow you Maybe, to I probably did, I probably did drink too much. Uh, I don't think I ever had a, like a real issue with it, but you know, it was probably something that sort of uh, numbed whatever was going on. You think so? Consciously or subconsciously? No, I think subconsciously. It was like anything to sort of like numb out and, and get out of that whatever headspace that was in. Yeah. Um, buddy games. Yeah. Uh, why have you said it's the hardest thing you've ever done in the business? Well, because it, it, because it is, directing a movie is really, really hard. And it is a lot of responsibility, a lot of expectation. I put a lot of pressure on myself. You are not only in the movie, but you're also directing it. So you're in a scene and you're also like watching what you're, the performance you're giving and going, okay, we need to adjust that and still be performing. And you got to know everything that the wardrobe and the scripties and everybody, you know, you know, you know what every department's doing and everybody's got questions because they all come to you to find out, do you like this color or this color? Uh, is this line okay for him to say? Or is that, it's like, it's nonstop from the time you get up in the morning until you go to bed at night and then you get up the next day. So the, by the time I was done with that first, uh, movie I'll never forget. The last night we shot uh, Buddy Games was in Vancouver, and it was a all, it was an all nighter, and we had one night to shoot this giant scene, and I had, and I saved I would I always just save myself to to last because I'd try to shoot everybody else out, and then I would just do my thing if I had to. And I remember it was about eight in the morning. We'd been working since like six the previous night, <laughs> and. It was my turn to speak, and I was like, I, I couldn't say my words. It was like, holy shit. I'm like literally, I'm so tired, I can't speak right now. And I didn't know what I was gonna do because I was like, oh my god, I have to say these words. And I was, and I was just sort of mumbling through them and I was slurring them, and I was like, could I was thinking about a million other things. We're like this close to the finish line. And and we ended up cutting a lot of that out, thankfully. Uh, but it was, uh, it and was. Do you think it was because the yeah. performance just wasn't? Yeah, it was, it was there. It, but it was also, you know, I, I'm, 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 uh, you know, brutal when it comes to edit. You know, if it's not funny, it's out. If it's not great, it, it's out. Unless it really, really pushes the story forward. But it was, you know, and and. I had no problem losing it. It was the scene was working without. I mean, we still had little bits of mine. And we found other ways to make it work. Uh, but I talked to Mel Gibson after we did well, while we were shooting Bandits. I wanted to pick his brain about how he. You know, I'm talking about buddy games. It's a stupid dude comedy. I mean, he but directed. It's... 
he directed Braveheart. Yeah. And okay. Bandit's like your favorite movie you've ever done, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. Um, one of them. Uh, but I asked Mel Gibson, I was like, how did you, because how did you lead that and, 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 and direct such an epic movie? You must have been exhausted. He's like, man. And he's, he told me the same story that I just told you, is that at the end of it, he couldn't even speak. He was so tired. He like, couldn't put words together. I was like, really? That happened to you too? I directed a movie called Buddy Games. And I, he's like, I'm sorry, what was that movie? I was like, never mind. <laughs> We're talking about the guy who directs, you know, one of the greatest directors of all time. What did it teach you? What? It, uh, buddy Games. Oh, uh, that I could do it. Uh, that I could that I could handle it, that I could lead a group of you know a, a, a crew, uh, and I could do it in a way that everybody felt really inspired because it was it was a really all hands on deck mentality on those movies, and it was uh, really gratifying to know that I didn't you know because I've worked with a lot of different types of directors and and it's and and I wanted to be a certain type. I wanted to be Which somebody. Is what? Somebody who, who allows the people, all these talented people to do their best work and not micromanage them or, or, or operate out of fear. You know, I didn't want them to feel like just, they're just here to get their job done and not get in trouble. I want them to like, you got an idea and it's better than mine, it's in, you know? And so it was a really collaborative, creative process that I think that people really enjoyed. And that's what I think I got the most out of it was like the ability to like get people to, rise up. Uh, uh, explain why you bought the rights back and what was involved in that. I bought the rights back because I had seen the movie uh, twice in theaters as in a test audiences and it just absolutely killed. I mean people were literally curling over laughing and we were like and I just remember going oh my god they think my dumb little movie is funny and and it really is, it's a funny movie. I mean, it's sophomoric at times, but it's really funny. And to see people actually responding to it that way made me understand and know that hey, this is not a movie that we're just gonna sell off in a fire sale. This is a movie that, need, that deserves a real shot. And uh, WWE at the time was, uh, they had, they, had, they, had, they had gone into a new leadership. The new leadership wasn't as on board as we were. And they were about to sell it off and, and nobody would have ever seen it. And I said, well, then I'm not promoting this movie. And they're like, what, what do you mean you're not gonna promote the movie? You're gonna ruin your career. I was like, I don't care. I'm not, I am not, that is not how this movie's gonna go out. I have put too much work into this thing for you and, I've, and I know that it works for you guys to go just, you know, take a tax write off on this thing. And so I said, I'll pay you whatever that company is going to pay you. And we get the rights and we get the TV rights. And, and they were like, I don't know. they didn't want to do it. We finally talked them into doing it. And sure enough, we got the right distributor behind it. And the movie did amazingly well. So well that we got to make another one. Uh, and we get to now make a TV show. And so, you know, it was, it was one of the ballsier things I think I've done, but it was, it was, I'm so glad I did it. Most financially successful work experience you've no. had because of that? No. No, okay. no, no, no. I mean, it did, I did okay, but it, it wasn't like, I, it wasn't like Transformers or something, you know, it, but it did, you know, it did win Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and it was there for a few weeks at number one. I was like, Wow. Our little tiny movie that wasn't supposed to go do anything did. And I'm so glad we got this back from them. And you bet on yourself every step of the way. Yeah. Uh, how about craziest thing that's actually ever happened in the real Buddy Games? The craziest thing that's ever happened in the real Buddy Games. <sighs> and this is because the film was created based on what you actually do. Yeah. With your Long right. time friends right. once a year. We get together once every year, every third weekend of August every year uh, for the annual Buddy Games. We've been doing it forever. I think the, the first sanctioned event was 2007, but we'd been doing it since 
90, the mid 90s. And uh, the craziest thing, oh my God, it's just, I don't even know if we could, <laughs> it's, it's these, whenever you've got friends that you've known this long, uh -huh. people just don't understand, you know, unless, unless they're there, unless they really understand you. So, I was going to say, are we getting to the answers? Somewhere? No, I mean, I, it, it, we're pretty disgusting. <laughs> I'll say that. Uh, especially Corey Hornbacher. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, as far as crazy events, we always do something crazy, whether it's right out here two years ago, we did a thing called Splattle, where you put everybody on a... Each team was... There's teams of four, and... We'd have one team would take turns was one man at a time would go from buoy A to buoy B and then had to, they had to they had to paddle their way across to the other and, and the other team got to sit there and shoot paint gun <laughs> pellets at them and to see these forty seven or eight year old men paddle boarding in their underwear getting blasted with paintballs was so funny it was like it's so stupid but it's just so funny and just to watch these guys i don't know if it was i don't know if it was the the action itself or the or the joy that these guys got knowing they got to shoot paintballs at their friends how about when one girl punched the other girl in the eye socket yeah, that was pretty crazy too. That was a uh, who told you that? I, one? I, oh, Bob I heard, told you I, that. I one. heard that was the yeah. time you guys decided. Okay, if any <laughs> single guys are here, yeah. no more ladies. Yes, exactly. That was uh, was several years ago now, but yeah, that was like no more. Any and you guys want to go do that? You can go do that before we get here, but we're not trying to. You know, we're not, we don't want cops showing up at the buddy games, which is what happened. Yeah. It was like a UFC fight. I think the girl was actually an MMA fighter. So when she had like a criminal record too, I'd probably. Or yeah. I don't know. Did you look that up? You no, probably I, did. That, that's what I was told. Oh, yeah. you yeah. probably looked that up. <laughs> I don't know the girl's name. <laughs> uh, so the uh, Steve Alford videos. You, oh you yeah, the Steve Alford videos. Yeah. Ashley, tell you about that? No, that was Cheddar. Just, uh, Oh, I said that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm so curious where you're getting all this stuff. Um, so I was, I was always all about sports growing up. And I loved football and basketball. And, and during the summer, I would, I would just practice and practice and practice. I was running. I was lifting. I was shooting. I was throwing. I was workaholic in a lot of ways. Kind of like I, I am now at times. And I good, would, good way or a bad way? Eh. I think it could be detrimental to my uh, mental uh, fitness and my my relationship at times. I just work I just work too much. I'm trying to get to a place where I don't have to do that as much. Um, and what's involved with that? What do you mean you, with getting to that? Just place? you know, there's just a, I, I I take too much on. Um, we're in the process of building a couple of things, and eventually I'll be able to hopefully step away a little bit more. But right now we're in the process of building them. Um, so yeah, the Steve Alford video, so Steve, you know who Steve Alford is? Sure. He yeah. played basketball at, at Indiana, played for the U S team. And I think he's a pretty good pro too, but he made a, a, a training video for basketball back in the late eighties. I think it was. And I would sit out in the driveway and just work on those drills. I'd put a broom inside of a folding chair, and that would be the hand that was defending me. I'd work on my, my jumpers or, you know, the, the, the ball handling things that he would do. I would practice those nonstop. And, yeah, it was, it was never one that didn't work. How about the basement with uh, Phil Collins blaring? Yep. I had Phil Collins blaring in the basement. I can see it. Coming in the air. Do -do 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 -do. Down in the <laughs> little basement in Northeast Minot, playing like hockey by myself. It's just what I did. I just, you know, we found ways to like entertain ourselves. What did I you see my I see my boy doing the same things now. It's fun because I say I know exactly what he's thinking. He sees like somebody doing something, he wants to go learn it. He's like, it becomes obsessed with it. So I'm starting to see certain aspects in, in, in him that I have that at first I wasn't sure because he, you know, he, you never know what 
you're gonna because he, he was always about superheroes and uh, and stuff like that. And uh, so I never, I wasn't sure if he was. You know, he's a little arts. He's an artsy little kid. So I figured that was what he was gonna go do. Now he's starting to play. He's all about soccer now. He wants to play soccer, and he's out there working on his ball handling drills. So, you know. Uh, what did you do to once weigh in at 200 pounds? Oh, uh, I wish I could just be at 200 pounds now. I used to want, I used to want to weigh 200. I, I was 6'2", 195 or something in college, and I wanted to be 200 pounds. And so I had those, those football tight pants that we'd have in it and stuff like two little two and a half pound weights in each one of the little pockets where you're supposed to put the pads and stepped onto the scale and I got to 199. I never got to 200. Not the case now. <laughs> um, I, so as I understand it, you, you put so much pressure on yourself as a high school athlete that your favorite years were actually seventh and eighth. Grade. Yeah. Describe that pressure. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, seventh and, eighth, seventh and eighth grade were truly my favorite years of school. That was when I first met all my best friends that I still have now. And one of your friends pointed out it's also because you got athlete of the year one of those years. I did, didn't I? I forgot about that. I did. And then, you know, high school, uh, played, on, played on the basketball team, played with a really good play, played with the best player in the state. His dad was the coach and uh, probably didn't get as much opportunity as I might have, but I may not have deserved it either. I don't know. Um, but I, I was I pretty was, good. I was told you did deserve it and the, the coach was yeah. kind of unfairly yeah. uh, Whatever. playing his son. You know what? If that's the case, good, because it taught me a lot. Did it? Yeah. You know, what did it teach it, you? It, 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 I used to have a lot of resentment, both for, for a couple of coaches, because I felt like I got sort of screwed, but I'm going to live my life worrying, you know, like rehashing the past. What, I, what happened was I learned a lot from that. I learned it put a f real fire in my belly to go prove that I could accomplish, I could do things, I, I was good enough. Because I think that that's where a lot of my my uh, drive came from was just trying to prove that I was good enough, and I and I applied that to what I'm in the in the business that I'm in now is constantly needing to prove that I belong, that I am good enough, that I am you know supposed to be here. Because I, I think you were told by two different coaches that you weren't going to make it uh, 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 along the way, and then there was a, another instance. Uh, where recruits are in and you oh, yeah. got into it with your coach. Yeah. Um, take me through everything you recall. Oh that boy. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was, that, you know, this is one of those situations I talked about with my sister being there. She, 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 I went through a lot of heartbreak in sports and also with girls through the years. But, um, yeah, I'm always reticent about about talking about it because I'm not trying to make excuses for what you know. I might have thought I was way better than I really actually was, you know. Um, but okay, whatever, but there's still the experiences that shaped you, right? And whatever whatever the case was, I felt like I earned the job, and we and we ended up like splitting time. He started, and I had to go. Like I was always, you know, and he was not great. And I, every time I go in, I would I would prove the coach wrong, and I think it became more of an ego thing be, about him wanting to prove that he was right, and 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 it just became this thing where he just didn't like me, you know, and uh, he wanted his kid from California, he wanted his kid from Vancouver, and then the local hometown kid was not supposed to beat these guys out, and yeah, and that was and that was uh, that was kind of that, I think that's where it it, it all sort of flamed up because I felt like he had it in for me. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, I don't know. But but I, I you know, we, whatever the case is, I was able to some, somehow, you know, channel that. What was said when the recruits were in town? Oh God, I think he, he brought, you know, he, he knew that we, we, he, we'd already like, we were, we were, we were beyond the bridge 
what, what's the phrase, beyond the point of no return. Yep. And I was now done with, I was done. And, and he still expected me as the captain. I was still captain of the team, by the way, to go, uh, you know, help him recruit these big studs from Seattle. And, he, and he's, or he's walking out of the hallway, I'm walking out the other way. And he's like, hey, Josh, I want you to meet uh, so-and-so. I was like, F you. Probably not the best thing to do. I was a bit of a punk, probably. But I really, really, really didn't like that guy at that point. I felt like he, you know, uh, had it in for me, and I was done with him. And I said so what that. Happened? And then he came back to me afterwards, and we had it out in the locker room. Didn't fight. We just, like, spoke, you know, our... our I told him what I thought of him, and he thought you told me what you thought of me. And that was it. Did you think up until around that time that you would end up going pro in some form of athletics? I mean, stuff? of course, whenever you play sports, you always think you're going to. You mm -hmm. think that that's the dream. But I learned early on that I wasn't nearly good enough to you play. You did? Yeah, I think by the time I was a, I mean, listen, no big schools recruited me. I was playing, you know, NIA Division Two. I knew that that wasn't probably a, a fast track to the NFL. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I, I understood. But, you know, you still have that dream. Like, what if I can do this? What if I can, you know? But, no, I learned pretty quickly that that wasn't going to happen. So during the period of time, uh, you're figuring out kind of what you want to do. I, I don't know if this fell exactly during then, but how true is it that when you once worked at Applebee's, uh, you got sent home because of your appearance? I'm told that you weren't one to necessarily dress yourself well. Oh, you mean in the in the proper? Well, you've seen uh, Office Space, right? Yeah. When she's not wearing enough of the um, what do they call it? Uh, the pins. Or... The pins, but they call it dazzle or something. Okay. Yeah, they call it something. It's really, it, it sort of reminds me of that. I don't think that I had my, I don't think I was pinned out enough or something. I don't remember the exact So I, I was also told that you're somebody that will wear your shirt inside out if that's how it's folded coming out of the laundry. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. And, and then That's come, probably true. I've never been that uh, fashion conscious. Which is interesting because, you know, you look uh, stylish. Thank you. I've had this since 1994. <laughs> um, and then the gap, they would not allow you to work on the floor. Yeah, so I got a job at the gap when I was in my first year. And when I moved, first moved to California, I needed a job. I went to the mall, the Santa Rosa mall, and went to the gap to try to get a job, any job. And they gave me a job in the back room like unboxing all the boxes that came in and folding and stuff up in the back so that when the front of the house salespeople came back, they would have like a new pair of 32, 42 jeans or whatever. Uh, and I always wanted to be, uh, I always wanted to be in the front of the house and you know, that's where all the action was, but I was always in the back. And so one time, so they did finally let me go up front and I was pretty fresh out of North Dakota and I was, I was a little bit, my style was a little bit ragged, I'll put it that way. I like to have holes in my jeans, and I might have worn T-shirts inside out. Uh, but I remember I had holes in my jeans when I went out to the front, and the manager's like, okay, no, you got to you, you back to the back of the house. Sent me back there right away. And how long was it after that that there were, like, full modeling photos of you? Oh, uh, from the Gap? Nationwide? Uh... <laughs> It must have been about five years later, I'd, I'd ended up doing a, a campaign for Gap. Which is funny how that yeah. works. Um, but so you had driven your car to California, the mm -hmm. vehicle with 275,000 yeah. miles on it or whatever. Yeah. Um, it, it was, uh, take me to the moment at the Sacramento Mall where you're approached by people. Uh, okay, so a guy named Hank Ritter who ran an agency in Sacramento, asked me if I was inter interested in modeling. And I was like, sure. That sounds like a lot better of a job than working in the back room at the Gap. So I, I, you know, I took some photos, and they started submitting me for some stuff. And that was kind of the beginning of it, Hank Ritter. 
who ultimately ended up going to work for another company that I won't name. Um, how about the odd job you did in Napa? Are you talking about the, when the construction job? Maybe. Um, well, and, and construction wasn't something that you were ever interested well, in. Well, stepdad, of... my stepdad owned a construction right. company. I never had any interest in working for him. I could have been a lot better off. I would have had a job like that yeah. had I like learned how to operate you know, machinery you know, when I was in mine up, but I'd never wanted to do it. I was always playing sports or whatever. Um, and I was working for a construction company. If, if you're talking about the same one where we take the ga old gas tanks out of the ground? Yeah, I think so, yeah. So California had a mandate at the time to take out, um, they wanted to, they had to get rid of all the old gas tanks that had been in there for 50 years that were single lined and were leaking fuel into the soil gasoline into the soil and so we would have to go in this company would go in take these old gas giant gas tanks out that you would that you'd pump from for the, at the gas stations take out all the saturated soil that had been you know leaking from these tanks for years and just like it was the most disgusting job because all i did all day was breathe in fumes and i was like the grunt laborer i was the guy who was up on top of the tank making sure everything was fastened properly and you know Ugh, it was a rough, rough job. And so you were struggling for a bit. You end up getting the All My Children gig. And correct me if I'm wrong, but your sister had to use her student loan money uh, to pay for your ticket to actually get to oh, the gig. Oh, that's right. That's right. She did. So I get a job at All My Children, which is a huge break for me at the time. And I had to get myself to New York to go like start work and I couldn't even afford a ticket there. So Ashley, God bless her, who also had no money, found it and was able to send me the money. I hope I did. Did I ever pay her back? I hope I did. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I have. Um, if not, I'll pay you back, Ashley. Um, I mean, but you just told her you'd give her a, a plot of land here. Yes. Well, I, that would definitely be payback. Uh, yeah. But yes, um, she did. That was the, that's my sister, though. She would she would do anything for me. So you were in Northern California for a bit, and I think it was a phone call that you had with your friend Bob, who was in L.A. That you know you guys hung up, and four hours later you call him and uh, say, "Can I, I come there?" Because yeah. you know you were doing your modeling thing there, but you know no models really ever presumably made it. Uh, you know, working gigs in Sacramento, your own. Uh, yeah, you know, no, well, I was actually living in San Francisco okay. at the time. I was living in San Francisco. Um, I had a girlfriend for several weeks, for several months, or several years, sorry, for like three years. Um, and I knew I wanted out of the relationship. I knew that I just it wasn't going to work. So I called, I call up Bob and I say, can I, can I come stay with you? And of course, Bob's like, absolutely. Then they already have three guys and they had, yeah, the uh, house two bedrooms. There was like guys there was like four guys, two bedrooms. It was just disgusting. But I drove down there and went in the old LTD, and uh, that was one of my. That's when I first moved to LA. And you were, as I understand it, pretty depressed then. Yeah, yeah, because like, well, I because I was so broke. You know, I had no money. Uh, I, I had like a cart, like a glove box full of parking tickets in San, from San Francisco. Because everywhere you park, you get a parking ticket. And I was terrible about it. Um, and had to call my stepdad for money. I think he gave me a thousand bucks. Um, and ultimately, I was able to pay him back. But yeah, for, for a couple of months, I didn't have any. I was like living on the couch, just trying to. As I understand it, you were kind of at like an all-time low. Well, you know like what? It, what was, if there's one moment during that period that like best, signifies that it's what I think it was the fact that I had already foregone dental school I was going to go to dental that's what I got my degree in at Monet State and uh, didn't know what I was going to do with myself I didn't have uh, I didn't really have any direction at that point and and that's kind of when I knew that I wanted to give it a shot because I, I I couldn't I could have gone back and got a dental school, but I was I had a feeling that I could make it work if I just could 
gain the courage. And and that's everything. I would go into these uh, these auditions and be like, in in, well, uh, do you know the story about how I got to even get in to go do well, auditions? Well, so you end up getting a temporary job at a talent agency. You're stuffing headshots mm -hmm. into envelopes, and that turns into getting some opportunities to go on right. auditions yourself. But then the, the criticism was pretty harsh. Yeah, right. So I didn't have, I, I wasn't actually working at the agency, but my one of the guys that was living there, Jim Vitlacha was his name, was working as an assistant to one of the agents at Don Buckwald and Associates and asked, and the guy that he, oh, he was, no, no, he was working in the mail room there. And also maybe as an assistant, but he was working in the mail room and the guy that he normally was in there stuffing H in. Howard on, Stern's agent, right? Yes. Okay. And he was in there, uh, you know, the guy that he was in there stuffing on, like, headshots and the things was sick that day. Jim calls me up and says, hey, do you want to come in and help me, um, you know, work? They'll pay you cash if you come in today. And, and where I was like, I'll do it. I needed money so badly. And uh, that's when one of the agents asked me if I was an actor. And I said, yeah. And I wasn't. Um, and they started sending me out. And I wasn't ready. But I did it anyway. And tried to fake it until I m made it, and it was it was rough. You know, that was my first sort of uh, you know instance where I I realized that if if I'm going to do this, I got to go like all in. I got to really really commit. Um, and I think that that's when I got uh, as they started sending me on these auditions. And one of them went so poorly that I didn't even talk about it when I got home. And the next Monday, we get back to school or get back, get back to the apartment. And Jim says, uh, so how'd that audition go on Saturday? And I was like, pretty good. He's like, apparently not. Uh, they said that if you don't do well in the next one, you're probably not going to go. They're probably not going to send you out anymore. And I was like, oh, my God. Sure enough, I had one more chance to like at least get some positive feedback, and I was able to get some positive feedback. I got a call back. I uh, didn't get the job, but you know it was enough to get me another opportunity. And eventually, I started getting a little bit more and a little bit more. And eventually, I think that's where I got this mentality that I had to go all in, like we talked about earlier. I had to be like completely committed, and the only way I knew how to do it was to like really put myself in these situations because if I did that, I could live in that space. And I remember doing that in an audition for this movie. It was my very first thing I ever booked, a <laughs> uh, picture of Dorian Gray. I was terrible in the movie, but it was, you know, it was brand new. But I had a couple moments that, that it, and I remember the moment that I got the job was that he had, he had like, he was at his wits end and he said, you know, he like lost it. And I, and I remember seeing the casting director being like, I knew then that I got the job. It was the first time I felt like, holy shit, I can actually do it. I can actually do this. Um, because for that moment, for there was a there was a moment when all the fear and all the you know the the you know I don't belong here. You're a fraud. All that stuff was gone, and I was just in the moment. So that's the moment you have to be in at all times if you're going to do this. You can't be in your head. You can't be thinking about anything else. You can't be scared. Can't be worried about people laughing at you. Can't be afraid of looking stupid. You got to just be completely open. And you know. And then from there, it was just one building block after another. Um, all my children, and then Vegas, and you know. And it kind of became obsessive for you. I, I think you started taking acting classes at one point. Yeah. Uh, you looked at Jack Nicholson. Jack Lemon, Tom Man. Hanks. I love Tom Hanks. He's one of my all-time favorites too. Uh, and elaborate on what you would do there. I would just watch how, how the greats did it. Um, and what were they doing differently? Okay. How would they commit? Like Jack Lemon was always in. He was always uh, present. Nicholson the same, but Jack Lemon was always. He's the, the, he he never was out of he had never st stopped you know he's just always kind of in the living in within the moment of whatever scene he was in brilliant actor and there's so many great ones that you can learn from but that's what I really started doing I just really really started watching what it was that made these guys great 
and you found that helped you how? Well, you know, the beautiful thing about being on a soap is that you have, you get to practice it every single day. I still contend that it's the best, one of the best places to learn if you're, if you're there to get better mm -hmm. and not get lazy. It was, for me, it was like, okay, I have an opportunity here to work every day, understand where my light is, understand, um, you know, how to take direction, understand where, how to hit my mark, understand how to learn a massive amount of lines every day and really be, become like proficient at this. And, and, and you can try things on a soap too, because even if you, if you fall flat on your face, you get to get up the next day and do it again. And so I really sort of took this attitude that I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get really, I just wanna use this, it's like rep after rep after rep, like I did the Steve Alford in the, in the uh, driveway at my house. I would just work and work and work at it. Every day I'd try to find something new and fun and uh, risky to do. How well, if at all, do you recall that primal scream? Primal scream? Yeah. There, so there was a scene uh, on the soap. Oh, yeah. Uh, I do where, remember. Where I think you were enraged at your mother. mother. That was another one of those moments and I was like, where'd that come from? You know, so it, it just it just gave me confidence to know that I had it if I could tap into it, and if I didn't fight it, if I really just stuck, stayed in the moment, really kept working, and trusted that I that I was good enough to be there. In the Las Vegas audition and getting caught in bed with the boss's daughter. What about it? Uh, that was what kind of sealed the deal for you in in getting the gig right because that was uh was that the, the scene the, I, the cre creator said that was far and away the toughest scene that uh, anybody coming into auditions could have coming yeah. into audition could have chosen and you were the only one uh that picked that scene yeah and uh, you know it's funny you bring that up because i hadn't thought of it from that perspective but the truth is uh, you know I almost had to do something that was, and I, I do, I vaguely do remember the scene, but yeah, I, I remember him, Gary Scott Thompson saying that exactly that, that you're the only one that picked that scene. And um, maybe it was just because I figured out a way that I could best play it. I don't think I was trying to pick the toughest scene. I think it was just the one that I felt I could, I could, I could figure out and, and perform the best. And, um, you know, be, but but that but but being on the soap for those three years, like I said, I, I I was willing to take risks. Like I had nothing to lose. It was sink or swim for me in that, especially now that I had completely foregone dental school. I had to make this work. I had to be good at it because I wanted. I didn't. I didn't know what else I was going to do. I didn't have a plan B. And so I took big risks on the show. And when I did that, it seemed like I got positive feedback for that and people started to like it and they started to like like Leo became like a pop really popular character on that show and then Leo and Greenlee became like the popular couple and I was like for the first time in my life had this this people had belief in me and they they like you know I, I felt like I'd had so much heartbreak in the in football and in, in basketball and these things that I'd put in so I'd, I had put so much effort into that never really got any kind of um reciprocation for and uh this was the first time i felt like i was i belonged a little bit and how did that make you feel felt great um it gave me the confidence to keep going and i think that that is where uh, i really started to get more and more comfortable even though i never really felt comfortable until several years later because after in the soap in, on the soap i felt like i had I, I, I belonged, but you get outside the soap, you try to go into the primetime world and, and like, no, 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 he's a soap actor. He can't, he can't do the, you know, the, the two different things. This is big time, that's just a soap. That was the per perception that people had. I was like, fuck that, there's some really good actors on the soap. Mm -hmm. You know, there really are, there still are. Uh, and a lot of good people have come from them. So I just, you know, and I was able to prove there that I, okay, I, I, can, get a, I can get a show. I can get, and then it was, then it was like getting a movie. It's like, try, I'm always, I still to this day feel like I'm always trying to bust out of whatever box they put me in. Do you? Oh yeah. Uh, still today? Yeah, not as much. I feel like I'm a little bit 
I, I just don't care as much anymore. I mean, I care deeply about the work and everything, but I don't care what people think mm -hmm. so much anymore. Um, I think that just comes with, you know, getting older, you just start to care less about what people say or think about you. But that was something that you've actively worked on as well, like caring less about what people think. Yeah, yeah, I think that I do, but I do care. I mean, I think that anybody that knows me probably says I care too much about what people think, and, I, and at the same time, as, uh, if we're just talking about the work, like the, like the act, work as an actor, the less you, it, it sounds like, it sounds like it, it can, it can be mis interpreted by like you don't give a shit or you're lazy by saying you don't care but the truth is uh, in Timothy Busfield I don't know if you know who that is he's a uh, fairly well-known actor really good director now too and he told me on Vegas dude it's like fishing in a river with your hands you can't just you can't go jabbing at the fish you gotta let the fish come to you and I think that's what he meant by and that's what I mean by saying you can't care is when you can't try so hard you just got to kind of let it come to you. And I think that that's something that I've learned to apply in general is that very few things really, really matter, unless it's family. How would you best explain how Steven Spielberg has impacted your career? Tremendously. You know, I've, I've told the story before, but, you know, it, it still blows my mind because he's such, a, he's such an amazing... Uh, part of Americana, you know, he's such a giant influence cinematically and in just in pop culture for decades now. And for that guy to like tap me for, for not only win a date with Ted Hamilton, but also Transformers, it's just, it's just you know, and, and for a guy that's that, you know, good at what he does and for, for so long to have the, um, the humility that he has also. He's a very normal, uh, humble guy. Why do you think he chose you? I don't know, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure why. He must have seen something in the auditions. Um, he's never actually hired me for any of his movies, so he can't be that big of a fan. Uh, but uh, regardless, the guy is has made a major impact on my career just by those couple little suggestions to both Michael Bay and to uh, Robert Luketic, who directed uh, Tad Hamilton. And you kind of blacked out on the call you had with Spielberg, right? I don't think, did I black out? I might have. I just, I, I, I actually remember the conversations pretty oh, clearly. You do. Oh, yeah. Okay. I couldn't believe that she patched me through to his house. Leslie Feldman, who's the casting director for Spielberg forever at DreamWorks, um, I called her and I said, like, Leslie, what do I, I, this is the second time he's, like, through the grapevine. He didn't, it's not like nobody, nobody even told me. It was both, it was like, heard it through producers or something you know that Spielberg recommended that they hire you for this I'm like what you gotta be kidding me and so I called Leslie after the second time and I think it was after I got uh, Transformers and I just said Leslie how do I thank a guy like Steven Spielberg for, for, for that it's like so tremendously you know uh, helpful in my career. It's like making all the, all the difference. And she said, well, why don't you, do you want me to patch you through? I was like, what? Yeah, I'll just go, hold on. Deet, 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 deet. He picks up the, he's at his office and wherever his house is, and he sits there and talks to me for 20 minutes about like, you know, how he saw the work that I did on Las Vegas and how he, he wants me to tap into that same, that remember I told you I went to that dark place after coming back from, from uh, Iraq and he goes, I want you to find that same sort of, that darkness for this character. I think it could be really cool in this movie and um, continue to do what you're doing. And you know, he just was really, really complimentary. Like I said, so, so much humility for a guy who doesn't have to be. A guy who's the, maybe the greatest who's ever done it, made some of the biggest movies of all time, doesn't have to do things like that. And he, and he does, and not just for me, he does it, I've heard about 
him doing things like that all the time. In what way did Transformers change the trajectory of your career? Well, I think it put me on the map. What it what it what it really did was it uh, it put me in a movie that that had you know huge international awareness. And whenever you're in a movie like that, it, it raises your um, ability to go raise money for other movies because now you 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 have this international awareness. So I think they called it your Q number or something, and those movies really kind of put me on the map globally, which then makes it, because at the end of the day, these things are always about money and they want people who are going to bring, and they have this, you know, if your, your number in their mind equates to money in the box office. So that's really what it helped me with. And it also, you know, personally it helped me just be, to, to be on a set of that size and to understand like, how big movies are made and, and all the politics and all the, the, you know, everything that goes into that. It was just a whole different world. And explain how 90% of your lines were given to you on the fly. Well, that's just the way Bay works a lot. And, and I'm a military, I was a military character, so a lot of my stuff wasn't really s scripted for, you know, pushing the story forward. It was mostly like directing directing the troops to go flank right, make sure, go, go, you know, most of, them, most of it was go, 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 no, go right, go left, shoot, you know, that was, those are mostly my, my lines in those movies. Um, so, I, I, I don't know, there was, and he came in one morning, it was a Monday morning, uh, and we'd been waiting there on set for, for, uh, for old Michael, and he, comes in with a piece of paper that he'd written on his way to, to work with a giant like di uh, monologue of this directive that I was to scream to these troops. Normally that would have taken me a week and a half to learn and I had like 12 minutes. Huh. And I was like, oh my God, you son of a <laughs> So, you and know. do you say that to him? In that probably, I think this is the, probably the second movie so I could, I could we, we, I love the, I love Michael Bay. He's a fun dude. You know, he gets a bad rap. He's a really fun uh, character and a, and a good director too. With, with even with actors, he, that's part of why he makes you. Part of what I guess my I learned a lot in that you never want to get too married to the words unless it's really, really about that because you want to have the flexibility to find room to improvise within that given whatever the scene, what's ever happening in the scene. You know, sometimes the words on the page don't always apply to what's actually happening in the scene, so you have to adjust that. So if you're too married to the words, suddenly it's hard to readjust. Does that make any sense? Do you understand oh, that? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I think because sometimes a, a scene will take on a life of its own without, and, and you don't know that until you get there and you're on the set and you're with the other actor and there's just things happening. And I learned from Michael that, you know, you have to, yes, learn your lines verbatim, forwards and backwards, but be ready to change on a moment's notice. And that's what you had to do on those sets. And there was a lot at stake for you, too. I think it was one of the, maybe the first or one of the er early films. Uh, you're going across the desert. Bombs are going off everywhere. Jets are flying overhead, and then an explosion yeah. launches you yeah. on screen for a few right. lines. Yeah. Um, oh, God, the pressure. Talk about pressure on a movie set, because every minute on those things is expensive. You've got giant, because they take an hour to set up some of these set pieces, just all the explosive here and explosive here. We're going to have a helicopter flying over here. Jets flying over here, and we've got all this stuff is in is is coordinated for this one moment. At the, you know, <laughs> and it all has to kind of go off according to how the camera's moving and everything else. And this scene involved all of these different explosions going off. I'm running through this field, boom, and flying through the thing. Stuff's flying all over the place. You get there, screaming in order here, screaming in order there, and then you you come into the camera, which is right here, and you got to like deliver whatever that line is, and you can't get up there and go. No, because cut, reset, 
And I just remember, the truth is, you could probably just re reshoot it right there and they could still make the whole thing work. But in my mind, this is like, I was still pretty green. All of this was down, coming down to me delivering this, this thing. On, and, and it was high pressure. Um, I can't remember if I, if I messed the line. Did I mess the lineup? I, I, don't, I think don't think I did. Because I put some, oh man. It was, uh, yeah, that was, yeah. And you it, learn how to deal with a lot of pressure on those sets for sure. Are you living in the moment in that or in a situation like that? Are you very, very aware of? Well, no, because those are real explosions going off around you. So you're kind of in it. Just like the, your ears are ringing, you're flying around, you're dirty. It's just like there's gunfire going off. All over. None of that is like CGI. That's all. I mean, yeah. the robots are, but everything else is practical. So just by proxy to all these explosions and stuff going off, you're, you feel like you're in an actual war zone. So it's not hard to get into that place. James Kahn. Uh, what do you think you learned from him? A lot. I love James Kahn. He's, uh, he, was, he was a mentor to me, truthfully. He was... Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. I worked with the guy for five years. Um, you know, always miserable, but always in a great mood. Like that guy who always has to... Even when, when things are really good, he'll find a way to make it you know, find it, make it, to make it dramatic or make it, you know, stir it up a bit. Um, but tremendously helpful, always had time for me, always had time for anybody on set. He never showed up and was like aloof. He was always like talking to people, whether it's the camera guys or the, you know, or messing with somebody over here. He's like, Josh, go over here. You gotta tell him the story about that. You know, he's like that guy. Um, just an absolute legend. And he'd give you notes oh, yeah. in between takes. Yeah, so I, again, this was early in my career. I was pretty green. I had just come off all my children and uh, trying to prove myself in the primetime world. And uh, you always knew when, when Jimmy didn't like your performance, when he'd be like, hey, come over here for a minute, kid, will you? And I'm like, oh, God, here we go. And he'd be like, just relax. Just let, just, you're working, trying too hard. You know, you gotta, you gotta just let the lines come. Try it again. Just do it. Just don't care so much. Just go. Okay, do it. Or he'd give you whatever. He'd, he'd like literally take you aside and give you notes. Normally, you don't do that with actors, but with a guy like James Caan and a young guy like me, I was like, thank you very much. I needed it, you know, and I'm glad that he took the time to do it. Didn't he give you family advice, too, uh, at, at some point that stuck with you? Or... Oh, I remember him saying something like, what did he say? He said something like, uh, you can learn a lot from me, what to do and what not to do. You know, because he, he was the first to admit that he made a lot of, he made a lot of, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a wild man in the 80s. I don't know if you ever read anything about that, but he would talk about that and he'd be like, you can learn, you can learn a lot from me and what to do and what not to do. Um, because he'd probably be the first one to admit, you know, he, he, he let it get away from him a little bit. But never lost that fire, and I love that about him. Uh, how about when you asked him if he'd ever worked with Brando? Yeah, that was one of my, <laughs> that was one of my dumbest, uh, that was one of my dumbest moves. We were, we were sitting around waiting when, during, a, during a setup of some sort, and you know, we are talking about movies and, uh, I, I asked him if he'd ever worked with Brando. And he's like, what, are you kidding me? I was like, oh yeah. He's like, I was in the Godfather, you dumbass. I was like, oh my God, Sonny Corley, I'm so sorry. Yes, of course you know, you know, because I hadn't put the two together that, that he uh, clearly had worked with Brando. Fergie, that relationship, your sister says, um, made you this is her opinion, uh, realize you can't expect somebody to be who you need them to be. You need to accept them for who they are. Yeah, I'd say that's probably true. Uh, and it probably works. She probably could say the same thing about me. You know, it was a um, great girl, great girl. But, you know, I think we both agree that we're, that we're just very different. Um, and we made an awesome kid. We get along great, and we get to raise him without any acrimony. She also said one thing she 
things you came to realize through that period was just the desire for a sense of normalcy in personal life? Yeah, you know, I don't think I ever really got comfortable with with all of it. It was just a lot. I just missed the simplicity of of who I really am, you know. How so? I'm, I'm just not a I'm just not a guy who is comfortable, you know, going to red carpets, doing all the Hollywood stuff. I don't, I don't hate it. I'm better at it now than I was, but I was really, it just took me a long time to really feel like I belong, like I fit in. Um, and so, you know, having this place out here really allows me to get back to that kid that fell in love with nature and fell in love with the outdoors and, and, and being creative and, and just being active. You know, Hollywood and LA and that whole lifestyle can, can suck the soul out of you if, you, if you if you're not careful. And, you know, I find myself sometimes when I'm there that I need to find a healthy outlet to, um, you know, get my hands dirty to get to, to, to do something that gives me some kind of a purpose. Now, I've had a lot of success there it's afforded me a lot of things. Very grateful for that. But it doesn't mean I have to live that lifestyle. Having this place out here almost helps my career because I can, I can get back to being like the, the, who I really am. If I'm there and I get caught up in that world, you start to lose track of who you are. And I don't think I've ever done that, thankfully. But it couldn't, it, it, there's been moments where I could have, you know, gone off the grid for sure. And that's why Audra's so great for me because she, we both love, you know, we're both hardcore North Dakotans who love it here, who love, you know, the people here, who have family here. Uh, we both love lake life. Uh, we both love family. We both love kids. Why was this the one topic that, from this whole interview, talking about all sorts of then that makes you uncomfortable? The what? Oh, the, the Fergie bit? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> it doesn't make me uncomfortable. I just, I've made peace with that part of my life. Yeah. She and I have a great relationship. We're both raising that boy together. Um, and there wasn't anything wrong with it. We, we actually had a, had a lot of, we had a great time, but I think we just kind of outgrew each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and had very different interests. And, I, and it, the older I got, the more I wanted to come back here. And then she had, she didn't, this is not for her. But I've got no hard feelings for it. I, I truly don't. I'm very lucky that she's a kind human, I really am. What's the process like figuring out how to co-parent a, a child with an ex? We both had parents who got divorced who, who um, didn't get along so great and didn't want to do the same thing to our kid. We knew that we, whatever differences we may have had, we had to like figure that out and, and you know, be like a, a positive uh, example for, for Axel. Easier said than done. Though. It is, it is easier said than done, but we both had good examples of what not to do. As much as I love my parents, it's like, you know what Christmas was? Most of the time, because you guys are fighting over where, where we were at what time and how much pressure we felt to make sure we weren't late to moms or we weren't late to dads. It was just like, ugh. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do all that. I just think that we both wanted the same thing, and that is to, you know, uh, create a, an easy uh, place for him that isn't awkward or uncomfortable or pressure-filled. You know, that's it. Another relationship to ask you about. Okay. Rochelle. I don't really want to out Rochelle. You know, I was probably over, overbearing and probably deserved to get left. I'm not sure she needed to go f one of my wide receivers right off the bat. <laughs> but I mean, it did. It, 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 it was kind of the thing that pushed me to California. I was like, yeah. you know what? I'm out of here. I've had it. It's time to get. It's time for Birdie to leave the nest. How many girlfriends cheated on you? I don't know. All of them. They all did. Oh, know. come on. I don't know. The only one that really, really hurt was that one, the Rochelle one, that I remember. Ah, no, another one. There are two of them. And that impacts dating how? Well, it just, you know, you, you're a little bit more hesitant to, to jump in. 
you know, try to protect yourself from, you know, feeling something like that again. Impact what you look for? No, well, yeah, impact what you look for, impact how, you know, quickly you, you know, fools rush in. And I think with age, you start to, you, you, you start to figure out how to meter that a little bit more or measure that a little bit more. I'm told you fall hard. <laughs> I'm working on it. I've always had these really long relationships. I've never like dated for like a month here, a month there. It's like three years, break up, a month later, and another relationship for four years. Like I've always been in these. So every time they end, it's like de been devastating. But yeah, you also have to like do it without like losing yourself, you know? And I've, uh, anyway, I've learned a lot. Once you've been beat up a few times, like you're banged up bachelor, you want to just sort of be like, you know what, I'm not going to fall that hard anymore because I don't want to hurt like that anymore. Uh, so how did you and Audra meet? Uh, we met at a barbecue at my house. Um, in L.A.? Or in L.A. Okay. So I'd, I'd heard about her, and I knew that she was, uh, and I'd seen her, but it was never like, I was never interested like that because I knew that she was younger. So I was like, you know what? I always root for the people from North Dakota if they go off and do cool things. And, um, and I knew she was in LA. You know, we talked back and forth on Instagram a couple of times. I said, I invited her over to a, a barbecue at my house. And I saw her and I was like, whoa, she's really beautiful. Like really, really beautiful um, and sweet. And immediately was like playing with the kids at the party. I was like, she had to go do that. She had to go play with the kids. Um, and there's just something so normal, you know? And, and I think I was really looking for that. Um, I'd been in this, I'd been in Hollywood long enough to not want to, you know, a certain type anymore. Just wanted normalcy. Um, and she just, she's just like, she's super fun, super funny. And uh, had all those things that we talked about, you know, the, the love of family, the love of home, the love of children, um, and the love of lake life. Because your family's each... Yeah, her family's got a cabin about an hour from here. Mm -hmm. uh, two of your friends I talked to brought this up, and then your sister acknowledged as much. But they were like, you know, Josh's professional life, He's very scheduled. Everybody tells him where he needs to be, when he needs to be there. And in Josh's personal life now, it's the same way. And that is amazing and does him wonders. Really? You know, somebody brought up, you know, Thanksgiving plans as example. And uh. They're like, you know, it's not Josh's fault that he does this. He just has a million things going on. Yeah. But I could ask, you know, Josh half a dozen times over a number of months uh, about Thanksgiving. He always says, I don't know. Um, and, you know, you don't figure it out till literally right before. Yeah. Now, <laughs> uh, you know, months out, I can say yeah. something to Audra. And yeah, because she's much. Yeah. In minutes. Right. And well, she's, she's far more organized in that regard than I am, for yeah. sure. And it's nice, too, because I know that she's on that part of it. Because the truth is, I don't know where I'm going to be a lot of the times. I don't know if I'm going to be available, but she plans. She's a planner, so, she, so we have like just a lot more structure, which is also nice. You know. Why do you think it works? What, she and I? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of the same interests. Um, and we're growing into, you know, the relationship is really growing beautifully. You know, it's not, it wasn't like this whirlwind thing that just sort of swept us both up and, you know, we got lost in the limerence of it all. But no, we actually built like a normal relationship, like, a, like grown ups. She's really mature for her age, and I'm really immature, which makes us about the same age. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, in, it, we just like building this, this, this healthy, relationship and, and, and I like her and love her more and more as we go. And COVID probably in a weird way only helped that, right? Well, it did and it didn't. She had to leave, she had to leave LA uh, during COVID 
because I wasn't, we weren't ready to move in together yet. Any, any job that she had, whether it was modeling or waitressing, was basically done for the time being. And so she came back home for a little bit. And that was when we really worked on, you know, are we, are we going to really work on this? And that's when we realized, yes, we absolutely have to. It's not a bad place to call home. No, either. it's pretty sweet. Booze. Booze. Uh, I, I uh, as watching you on Steve-O's podcast, uh-huh. uh, Steve-O taped an episode with before, mm-hmm. uh, awesome dude, um, and I was kind of surprised the extent to which you got into it, uh, you know, there with them. Um, how has, like, the role th- that's played in your life and uh, the role you wanted to play moving forward? Uh, you know, I think... You know, for the first you know, 30, 40 days, I like quit, which was great. And then we went to Mal or no, where did we go? Went to M- Monaco. Or- to back up, the, you decided one day you you your normal yeah. routines, a couple of Red Bull, sugar free Red yeah, Bull, yeah, sugar free Red Bull vodkas <laughs> was my thing around this time. With good reason, perhaps tonight. <laughs> uh, uh, but you just decided, you know what, I'm gonna. Yeah, I just decided to take a little break from it, it. Yeah. just just because I've had a lot of friends who have really, really, uh, I've a lot of friends who have witnessed their lives sort of elevate, mm-hmm. and they they just they quit drinking, they quit doing all the stuff. Um, now they were pretty extreme, but I still felt like you know what. There is something to that. There's something about that sober life that's interesting, and and uh, it's just reconciling. You know, can you still have a good time without it? And the truth is, you can. I was witness to that. Um, I still have a few beers here and there now, but I like to go take a month or two off, or a month off at a time. Sometimes just to. Do you? Yeah. Um, just to, you know, just to clean it up, you know, it's hard when you're out here too. Cause it, you know, it, it, beer tastes really good by the lake. <laughs> right. So, you know, that's, that there's that, but at the same time, do I need it in my life? Probably not. Well, you, you said you felt, uh, less creative, uh, when you were, uh, your words on, on the podcast, when, when I was drinking? Yeah. I, I mean, with, the, you know, the couple Red Bull vodka. Yeah, you're probably right. I'd probably get, just get a little bit numbed out. You know, I think that's what it does sometimes. It numbs you out. And you don't, you're not as aware or as curious or as... You said or as present. Or as present as, as you could be. Um, so, yeah. Or is it just something that you find yourself overthinking and your setup, how you've always done, it's completely fine. Yeah. It's just... I mean, I'll always, I think I'll always have that creative thing in me, but you know, it is, it is nice. I think sometimes, at least for me to clean it up. Um, maybe at some point I will forever. Um, do you think that would be good for you? I don't, I, don't, I, I think I'm not sure alcohol is ever really good. Does it ever really? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it, it harms people, you know, less or more according to the person, but I'm not sure it ever really enhances anything, does it? I mean, everything in moderation is probably fine. Everything in moderation, including moderation. <laughs> How about the, the fake ID in college? The fake ID in college was, and your mom oh finding God, out. that was such a ter- that was such a terrible moment. It's a pretty wor- spectacular story. I, I was right? working at Applebee's. Well, I had I had sort of perfected the art of making fake IDs in in college, or what I thought I had done. And I, they still didn't know how I did it, but they still caught me. <clears throat> I would I would take these things I'd, and I'd and I'd you know talk about creative. I would I would manipulate the thing. I was able to create like I was born in seventy, you know, or born in uh, ninety. No, born in 80, and I was able to make it so it looked just like the actual type. 
Would you laminate over the top of it? Nobody could tell. And they still, when they even showed it on the news, they couldn't tell. But I still got caught. Um, How? Trying to buy beer for friends at a at a drive through uh, uh, liquor store in college, and I was able to keep it out of the papers until. Wait, so what happens? You're driving through and driving through. I give them my ID, and they come back. Um, yeah, and I'm like, guys, it's taking them a while. What's going on here? And then I look in the rear view, and I was like, oh, no, there's a cop behind. Pulls us over, takes me in, puts me in the clink for like a night or oh, a that's few no hours. Joke. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, this was a It was like a holding cell. at the pre- Yeah, they put me in a holding cell at the thing. So, yeah, I, can, I guess I could say I've been in jail. Gives you some street cred. Yeah. But, um... But yeah, it was a dumb college move that that uh, got me in. Tr- that I thought I got out of because nobody found out until uh, North Dakota did like this statewide expose on uh, this trend of you know fake IDs in the state. And whose do they use as the example? Right there on the news is mine. My mom was so mad. She called and she's so mad that she called me at work. I was working as an, a waiter at Applebee's at the time. And, and your mom was a teacher. Yeah, she was a teacher. She was so upset with me. Like, how can you do this? How can you do this? I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And, and she, she literally was just irate. And I'm a college student, you know, 20 and a half years old. Uh, so, yeah, that was, that was that. So I've seen you many years uh, at AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am. What do you enjoy about that? Besides, uh, what do I enjoy? I enjoy? What don't I enjoy about it? I mean, I have so much fun at that tournament. I think that that's where I first met you was at the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro. And I'm like, who is this kid who wants to interview? He looks like he's 12 years old. And I remember going, that kid's going to make it someday. And look at you now. Oh, You're like, please. got your own TV show, traveling the world, talking to Steve-O, Dan Balzarian. <laughs> Uh, it is funny though how time flies because that's where we first met. But yeah. We first spoke on the phone. Yeah. For my local St. Louis radio show yeah. when I was probably late teens or early twenties. Uh, I thought you were like. Could have 15? even been. It, it could have even been fifteen, 15 16. sixteen. That's when you started doing all this, right? Uh, I started fourteen. Yeah. Fourteen, and that was how many years ago then? You're how old uh, now? Thirty-seven. So it's twenty-three years ago. Yeah. Twenty-three years ago. But so at some point in that window, but it's amazing how time flies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so Pebble Beach. So I just love Pebble. I mean, so I, this, first of all, it's maybe the most beautiful place in the world. It's got to be up there. The golf is incredible. The tournament's got all kinds of history. I've made a lot of good friends up there now, having played it 12 or 13 times. Um, and that's just one of those things you look forward to every year. I mean, you, and you just hope you get that invite because it doesn't last forever. How about single best time you've ever had there? Well, there's two. There's when I played with Sergio one year and we took second, and I just made some shot. I played on Sunday, like, out of my mind. Uh, and then I played really well with Tony Finau just a few years ago uh, where we took third, and that was – those are the ones where you really actually compete and play. I always have a good time. I don't really go. I mean, nobody expects me to play good golf. I'm just not. I'm average. Um, and I used to, when I first went, took the golf part of it very seriously. But at this point, I just mostly go just to have fun, you know, see old friends, get to take in the beautiful scenery there, uh, and just be a part of the rich history of that place. And it's a whole thing just getting the invite. It really is. Uh, what's that like for you? It's always exciting. You get that nice leather-bound invite that says the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am. I mean, it's like uh, it's like Christmas. So I told you we had somebody tape a question uh, okay. for you. Hey, what's up, Josh? <laughs> Adrian Hope all Peterson. Is well, brother. So, uh, so I heard that you grew up a huge Vikings fan, and uh, you are a fan of mine. First off, I just want to say appreciate the love and the support, man. You know, it really means a lot. I played the game to to add as many fans as possible and uh, to make sure they enjoyed my craft and remembered it. 
you know, uh, kind of similar to what you do um, on the big screen, man. So here's a question I have for you. <clears throat> so you growing up and being originally from North Dakota, what turned you into a Vikings fan over the Green Bay Packers? <laughs> and another question I have, what do you think the Vikings need to finally get over that hump and make it to the championship game? And win the championship game. AP, one of the greats. Wow, that's cool. That's really cool. Well, Adrian Peterson, thank you for that question. Um, man, he was good. So tough. Um, what made me a Vikings fan over a Packers fan? My mom is actually a big Packers fan. Um, so there, I guess there could have been a chance I would have been that, but it just never. I think what it was is, is I used to like the Cowboys as a kid because I was sort of a contrarian. Everybody likes the Vikings. Well, I'm going to like another team, so I picked the Cowboys as a kid. Troy Aikman Before, was your guy. Yeah, I love Troy Aikman. He's still maybe my favorite of all time. But then I, when I moved away half a lifetime ago or more than half time a lifetime ago, it was like, it was like my connection to home. You know, I took for granted that the Vikings games were always on on Sunday here. And then when I left, I had to go find them. And I think there was that, it was like that connection to home for me. And then I've just become more and more of a Vikings fan. It's really frustrating because they're always a good team. They're always up there. In fact, I think they're top 10 or five all time in winning percentage in the NFL, yet don't have a Super Bowl. And we've had some like, like brutal heartbreaking losses in the playoffs. It's just brutal. So I think that there's, you know, there's, a, there's, there's that, Every year, it's like, this is, there's hope. This is our year. This is our year. This is our year. And it always ends in some kind of a heartbreak. But I do think that, to answer the other part of his question, that the, the Vikings got a real shot to get there. I mean, maybe this year, because last year we had a great team. Uh, didn't have, I thought our defensive coordinator was not good. And we are, for the first time, we had this, this winning offense, and suddenly our, the Vikings defense, which is always good, was terrible. And so now we've got Brian Flores, we've got Kevin O'Connell, we've got Kirk, who I hope does really well. I've become a really big fan of his after watching how cool a guy he is. I feel bad about all the shit. I talked about him for years. Oh, did you? Oh, I was so mean to him, and I feel terrible about it. But Has um, your path ever crossed with his? No, I've never met him. Okay. Um, but it could. It just depends on, did we replace Delvin Cook? Did we replace some of these D linemen that we lost? We lost some players, and it just depends on whether or not we replaced them. There you go. So is this the year? It's a, this is always the year. <laughs> it's always the year until it's not.